Welcome back to The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. I'll be reading through the entire book. Today's chapters are eight and nine. And I've noticed that the sentences are long. That sometimes makes it difficult to read because you think you're coming to the end of the idea, a sentence being a complete idea, but no, it continues. So one example here, I'll just read it's in chapter six. This is one sentence. But sometimes I saw her myself, not only when she came to church, but when she was out on the hills with her son, whether taking a long purpose-like walk or on special fine days, leisurely rambling over the moor or the bleak pasture lands surrounding the old hall, herself with a book in her hand, her son gambling about her, and on any of these occasions when I caught sight of her in my solitary walks or rides, or while following my agricultural pursuits, I generally contrived to meet her or overtake her, for I rather liked to see Mrs. Graham than talk to her, and I deliberately liked to talk to her little companion, whom, when once the ice of his shyness was fairly broken, I found to be very amiable, intelligent, and entertaining little fellow, and we soon became excellent friends. How much to the gratification of his mamma, I cannot undertake to say. That was one sentence. <laughs> so it's a little bit, sometimes a little bit hard to read, but we're going to just do it. So now as I begin chapter eight, the first sentence is five words long and the second sentence is a paragraph long and not a little paragraph, which begins with, it was a splendid and ends with a portable edition of Marmion. Marmion was a long poem by Sir Walter Scott. And I think it's about agriculture. It was a well-known poem at the time, apparently beloved by the Bronte sisters. Well, let's go. Chapter eight, the present. Six weeks had passed away. It was a splendid morning about the close of June. Actually, that sentence is another one. Now it's a paragraph. Most of the hay was cut, but the last week had been very unfavorable. And now that fine weather was come at last being determined to make the most of it, I had gathered all hands together into the hay field and was working away myself in the midst of them in my shirt sleeves, with a light, shady straw hat on my head, carrying up armfuls of moist, reeking grass and shaking it out to the four winds of heaven, at the head of a goodly file of servants and hirelings, intending so to labor from morning to night with as much zeal and assiduity as I could look for from any of them, as well to prosper the work by my own exertion as to animate the workers by my example, when, lo, my resolutions were overthrown in a moment by the simple fact of my brothers running up to me and putting into my hand a small parcel just arrived from London, which I had been for some time expecting. I tore off the cover and disclosed an elegant and portable edition of Marmion. I guess I know who that's for, said Fergus, who stood looking on while I complacently examined the volume. That's for Miss Eliza now. He pronounced this with a tone and looked so prodigiously knowing that I was glad to contradict him. You're wrong, my lad, said I, and taking up my coat, I deposited the book in one of its pockets and then put it on, i.e. the coat. Now come here, you idle dog, and make yourself useful for once, I continued. Pull off your coat and take my place in the field till I come back. Till you come back? Where are you going, pray? No matter where. The when is all that concerns you, and I shall be back by dinner at least. Oh, ho! And I'm to labor away till then, am I? And to keep all these fellows hard at it besides? Well, well, I'll submit for once in a way. Come, my lads, you must look sharp. I'm coming to help you now. And woe be to the man or woman either that pauses for a moment amongst you, whether to stare about him, to scratch his head, to blow his nose. No pretext will serve. Nothing but work. Work, work in the sweat of your face, etc., etc. Leaving him thus haranguing the people, more to their amusement than edification, I returned to the house, and having made some alteration in my toilet, hastened away to Wildfell Hall with the book in my pocket, for it was destined for the shelves of Mrs. Graham. What then had she and you got on so well together as to come to the giving and receiving of presents? Not precisely, old buck, 
This was my first experiment in that line, and I was very anxious to see the result of it. We had met several times since the Bay excursion, and I had found that she was not adverse to my company, provided I confined my conversation to the discussion of abstract matters or topics of common interest. The moment I touched upon the sentimental or the complimentary, or made the slightest approach to tenderness in word or look, I was not only punished by an immediate change in her manner at the time, but doomed to find her more cold and distant, if not entirely inaccessible, when next I sought her company. This circumstance did not greatly disconcert me, however, because I attributed it not so much to any dislike of my person as to some absolute resolution against the second marriage formed prior to the time of our acquaintance, whether from excess of affection for her late husband or because she had had enough of him and the matrimonial state altogether. At first, indeed, she seemed to take a pleasure in mortifying my vanity and crushing my presumption relentlessly, nipping off bud by bud as they ventured to appear. And then I confess I was deeply wounded, though at the same time stimulated to seek revenge, but latterly finding beyond a doubt that I was not that empty-headed coxcomb she had first supposed me. She had repulsed my modest advances in quite a different spirit." It was a kind of serious, more sorrowful displeasure, which I soon learnt carefully to avoid awakening. Let me first establish my position as a friend, thought I, the patron and playfellow of her son, the sober, solid, plain-dealing friend of herself, and then, when I have made myself fairly necessary to her comfort and enjoyment in life, as I believe I can, we'll see what next may be effected. So we talked about painting, poetry and music, theology, geology, and philosophy. Once or twice I lent her a book, and once she lent me one in return. I met her in walks as often as I could. I came to her house as often as I dared. My first pretext for invading the sanctum was to bring Arthur a little waddling puppy, of which Sancho was the father and which delighted the child beyond expression and consequently could not fail to please his mama. My second was to bring him a book, which, knowing his mother's particularity, I had carefully selected and which I submitted for her approbation before presenting it to him. Then I brought her some plants for her garden in my sister's name, having previously persuaded Rose to send them. Each of these times I inquired after the picture she was painting from the sketch taken on the cliff and was admitted into the studio and asked my opinion or advice respecting its progress. My last visit had been to return the book she had lent me, and then it was that in casually discussing the poetry of Sir Walter Scott, she had expressed a wish to see Marmion, and I had conceived the presumptuous idea of making her a present of it, and on my return home, instantly sent for the smart little volume I had this morning received. But an apology for invading the hermitage was still necessary. So I had furnished myself with a blue Morocco collar for Arthur's little dog, and that being given and received with much more joy and gratitude on the part of the receiver than the worth of the gift or the selfish motive of the giver deserved, I ventured to ask Mrs. Graham for one more look at the picture if it was still there. Oh yes, come in, said she, for I had met them in the garden. It is finished and framed. It's all ready for sending away. But give me your last opinion, and if you can suggest any further improvement, it shall be duly considered, at least. The picture was strikingly beautiful. It was the very scene itself transferred as if by magic to the canvas, but I expressed my approbation in guarded terms and in few words for fear of displeasing her. She, however, attentively watched my looks and her artist's pride was gratified, no doubt, to read my heartfelt admiration in my eyes. But while I gazed, I thought upon the book and wondered how it was to be presented. My heart failed me but I determined not to be such a fool as to come away without having made the attempt. It was useless waiting for an opportunity and useless trying to concoct a speech for the occasion. The more plainly and naturally the thing was done, the better I thought. So I just looked out of the window to screw up my courage and then pulled out the book, turned round and put it into her hand with this short explanation. 
You were wishing to see Marmion, Mrs. Graham, and here it is, if you will be so kind as to take it. A momentary flush suffused her face, perhaps a blush of sympathetic shame for such an awkward style of presentation. She gravely examined the volume on both sides, then silently turned over the leaves, knitting her brows the while in serious cogitation, and then closed the book and turning from it to me quietly asked the price of it. I felt the hot blood rush to my face. I'm sorry to offend you, Mr. Markham, said she, but unless I pay for the book, I cannot take it. And she laid it on the table. Why cannot you? Because, she paused and looked at the carpet. Why cannot you? I repeated with a degree of irascibility that roused her to lift her eyes and look me steadily in the face. Because I don't like to put myself under obligations that I can never repay. I am obliged to you already for your kindness to my son, but his grateful affection and your own good feelings must reward you for that. Nonsense, ejaculated I. She turned her eyes on me again with a look of quiet, grave surprise that had the effect of a rebuke, whether intended for such or not. Then you won't take the book, I asked more mildly than I had yet spoken. I will gladly take it if you will let me pay for it. I told her the exact price and the cost of the carriage besides, in as calm a tone as I could command, for, in fact, I was ready to weep with disappointment and vexation. She produced her purse and coolly counted out the money, but hesitated to put it into my hand. Attentively regarding me in a tone of soothing softness, she observed, You think yourself insulted, Mr. Markham. I wish I could make you understand that I... that I... I do understand you perfectly, I said. You think that if you were to accept that trifle from me now, I should presume upon it hereafter, but you are mistaken. If you will only oblige me by taking it, believe me, I shall build no hopes upon it and consider this no precedent for future favors. And it is nonsense to talk about putting yourself under obligations to me when you must know that in such a case, the obligation is entirely on my side, the favor on yours. Well, then I'll take you at your word, she answered with a most angelic smile, returning the odious money to her purse. But remember, I will remember what I have said, but do not you punish my presumption by withdrawing your friendship entirely from me or expect me to atone for it by being more distant than before, said I, extending my hand to take leave, for I was too much excited to remain. Well, then, let us be as we were, replied she, frankly placing her hand in mine, and while I held it there, I had much difficulty to refrain from pressing it to my lips, but that would be suicidal madness. I had been bold enough already, and this premature offering had well nigh given the death blow to my hopes. It was with an agitated, burning heart and brain that I hurried homewards, regardless of that scorching noonday sun, forgetful of everything but her I had just left, regretting nothing but her impenetrability and my own precipitancy and want of tact, fearing nothing but her hateful resolution and my inability to overcome it, hoping nothing but halt. I will not bore you with my conflicting hopes and fears, my serious cogitations and resolves. Chapter 9. A Snake in the Grass Though my affections might now be said to be fairly weaned from Eliza Millward, I did not entirely yet relinquish my visits to the vicarage, because I wanted, as it were, to let her down easy without raising much sorrow, or incurring much resentment, or making myself the talk of the parish, and besides, if I had wholly kept away the vicar who looked upon my visits as paid chiefly, if not entirely, to himself, would have felt himself decidedly affronted by the neglect. But when I called there the day after my interview with Mrs. Graham, he happened to be from the house, a circumstance by no means so agreeable to me now as it had been on former occasions. Miss Millward was there, it is true, but she, of course, would be little better than a non-entity. However, I resolved to make my visit a short one and to talk to Eliza in a brotherly, friendly sort of way, 
such as our long acquaintance might warrant me in assuming, and which I thought could neither give offense nor serve to encourage false hope. It was never my custom to talk about Mrs. Graham, either to her or to anyone else. But I had not been seated three minutes before she brought that lady on the carpet herself in a rather remarkable manner. Oh, Mr. Markham, said she with a shocked expression and a voice subdued almost to a whisper. What do you think of these shocking reports about Mrs. Graham? Can you encourage us to disbelieve them? What reports? Ah, uh, now, you know. She slyly smiled and shook her head. I know nothing about them. What in the world do you mean, Eliza? Oh, don't ask me. I can't explain it. She looked up at the cambric handkerchief, which she had been beautifying with a deep lace border and began to be very busy. What is it, Miss Millward? What does she mean? said I, appealing to her sister, who seemed absorbed in the hemming of a large coarse sheet. I don't know, replied she. Some idle slander. Somebody has been inventing, I suppose. I never heard it till Eliza told me the other day. But if all the parish dinned it in my ears, I shouldn't believe a word of it. I know Mrs. Graham too well. Quite right, Miss Millward, and so do I, whatever it may be. Well, observed Eliza with a gentle sigh, it's well to have such comfortable assurance regarding the worth of those we love. I only wish you may not find your confidence misplaced. As she raised her face and gave me such a look of sorrowful tenderness as might have melted my heart, but within those eyes there lurked a something that I did not like, and I wondered how I ever could have admired them. Her sister's honest face and small gray optics appeared far more agreeable. But I was out of temper with Eliza at that moment, for her insinuations against Mrs. Graham, which were false, I was certain, whether she knew of it or not. I said nothing more on the subject, however, at the time. And but little on any other, for finding I could not well recover my equanimity, I presently rose and took leave excusing myself under the plea of business at the farm, and to the farm I went, not troubling my mind one whit about the possible truth of these mysterious reports, but only wondering what they were, by whom originated, and on what foundations raised, and how they could be most effectually be silenced or disproved. A few days after this, we had another of our quiet little parties, to which the usual company of friends and neighbors had been invited, and Mrs. Graham among the number. She could not now absent herself under the plea of dark evenings or inclement weather, and, greatly to my relief, she came. Without her, I should have found the whole affair an intolerable bore, but the moment of her arrival brought new life to the house, and though I must not neglect the other guests for her, or expect to engross much of her intention and conversation to myself alone, I anticipated an evening of no common enjoyment. Mr. Lawrence came too. He did not arrive till some time after the rest were assembled. I was curious to see how he would comport himself to Mrs. Graham. A slight bow was all that passed between them on his entrance, and having politely greeted the other members of the company, he seated himself quite aloof from the young widow between my mother and Rose. Did you ever see such art? whispered Eliza, who was my nearest neighbor. Would you not say they were perfect strangers? Almost, but what then? What then? Why, you cannot pretend to be ignorant. Ignorant of what? demanded I, so sharply that she started and replied, Oh, hush, don't speak so loud. Well, then tell me, I answered in a lower tone. What is it you mean? I hate enigmas. Well, you know, I don't vouch for the truth of it. Indeed, far from it. But haven't you heard? I've heard nothing except from you. You must be willfully deaf then, for anyone will tell you that. But I shall only anger you by repeating it, I see, so I had better hold my tongue. She closed her lips and folded her hands before her with an air of injured meekness. If you had wished not to anger me, you would have held your tongue from the beginning or else spoken out plainly and honestly all that you had to say. She turned aside her face, pulled out her handkerchief, rose and went to the window where she stood for some time evidently dissolved in tears. I was astounded, provoked, ashamed, not so much for my harshness, but for her childish weakness. However, no one seemed to notice her, and shortly after we were summoned to the tea table, 
In these parts, it was customary to sit at the table at tea time on all occasions and make a meal of it, for we dined early. On taking my seat, I had Rose on one side of me and an empty chair on the other. May I sit by you, said a soft voice at my elbow. If you like, was the reply, and Eliza slipped into the vacant chair. Then, looking up in my face with a half-sad, half-playful smile, she whispered, You're so stern, Gilbert. I handed down her tea with a slightly contemptuous smile and said nothing, for I had nothing to say. What have I done to offend you? She said more plaintively. I wish I knew. Come, take your tea, Eliza, and don't be foolish, responded I, handing her the cream and sugar. Just then arose a slight commotion on the other side of me, occasioned by Miss Wilson's coming to negotiate an exchange of seats with Rose. Will you be so good as to exchange places with me, Miss Markham? said she, for I don't like to sit by Mrs. Graham. If your mamma thinks proper to invite such persons to her house, she cannot object to her daughter keeping company with them. This latter clause was added with a sort of soliloquy when Rose was gone, but I was not polite enough to let it pass. Will you be so good as to tell me what you mean, Miss Wilson, said I. The question startled her a little, but not much. Why, Mr. Markham, she replied coolly, having quickly recovered her self-possession. It surprises me rather that Mrs. Markham should invite such a person as Mrs. Graham to her house, but perhaps she is not aware that the lady's character is considered scarcely respectable. She is not, nor am I, and therefore you would oblige me by explaining your meaning a little further. This is scarcely the time or place for such explanations, but I think you can hardly be so ignorant as you pretend you must know her as well as I do. I think I do, perhaps a little better, and therefore, if you will inform me from what you have heard or imagined against her, I shall perhaps be able to set you right. Can you tell me, then, who was her husband, or if she ever had any? Indignation kept me silent. At such a time and place, I could not trust myself to answer. Have you never observed, said Eliza, what a striking likeness there is between that child of hers and... And whom? demanded Miss Wilson with an air of cold but keen severity. Eliza was startled. The timidly spoken suggestion had been intended for my ear alone. Oh, I beg your pardon, pleaded she. I may be mistaken. Perhaps I was mistaken. But she accompanied the words with a sly glance of derision directed to me from the corner of her disingenuous eye. There's no need to ask my pardon, replied her friend, but I see no one here that at all resembles that child except for his mother. And when you hear ill-natured reports, Miss Eliza, I will thank you. That is, I think you will do well to refrain from repeating them. I presume the person you allude to is Mr. Lawrence, but I think I can assure you that your suspicions in that respect are utterly misplaced. And if he has any particular connection with the lady at all, which no one has the right to assert, at least he has, which cannot be said of some others, sufficient sense of propriety to withhold him from acknowledging anything more than a bowing acquaintance in the presence of respectable persons. He was evidently both surprised and annoyed to find her here. Go it, cried Fergus, who sat on the other side of Eliza and was the only individual who shared that side of the table with us. Go it like bricks. Mind you, don't leave her one stone. Go it like bricks. Mind you, don't leave her one stone upon another. Miss Wilson drew herself up with a look of freezing scorn, but said nothing. Eliza would have replied, but I interrupted her by saying as calmly as I could, though in a tone which betrayed no doubt some little of what I felt within. We have had enough of this subject. If we can only speak to slander our betters, let us hold our tongues. I think you'd better, observed Fergus, and so does our good parson. He has been addressing the company in his richest vein all the while and eyeing you from time to time with looks of stern distaste while you sat there irreverently whispering and muttering together. And once he paused in the middle of a story or a sermon, I don't know which, and fixed his eyes upon you, Gilbert, as much as to say, when Mr. Markham has done flirting with those two ladies, I will proceed. What more was said at the tea table, I cannot tell, nor how I found patience to sit through till the meal was over. 
I remember, however, that I swallowed with difficulty the remainder of the tea that was in my cup and ate nothing, and that the first thing I did was to stare at Arthur Graham, who sat beside his mother on the opposite side of the table, and the second to stare at Mr. Lawrence, who sat below, and first it struck me that there was a likeness. But on further contemplation, I concluded that it was only an imagination. Both, it is true, had more delicate features and smaller bones than commonly fall to the lot of individuals of the rougher sex, and Lawrence's complexion was pale and clear, and Arthur's delicately fair, but Arthur's tiny, somewhat snubby nose could never become so long and straight as Mr. Lawrence's, and the outline of his face, though not full enough to be round, and to finally converging to the small dimpled chin to be square could never be drawn out to the long oval of the others, while the child's hair was evidently of a lighter, warmer tint than the elder gentleman's had ever been, and his large, clear blue eyes, though prematurely serious at times, were utterly dissimilar to the shy, hazel eyes of Mr. Lawrence, whether the sensitive soul looked so distrustfully forth as ever ready to retire within from the offenses of too rude, too uncongenial world. Wretch that I was to harbor that detestable idea for a moment. Did I not know Mrs. Graham? Had I not seen her conversed with her at time after time? Was I not certain that she in intellect, in purity, and in elevation of soul was immeasurably superior to any of her detractors? that she was in fact the noblest, most adorable of her sex that I had ever beheld or ever imagined to exist? Yes, and I would say, with Mary Millward, sensible girl as she was, that if all the parish, ay, or all the world should din these horrible lies in my ear, I would not believe them, for I knew her better than they. Meantime, my brain was on fire with indignation, and my heart seemed ready to burst from its prison with conflicting passions. I regarded my two fair neighbors with a feeling of abhorrence and loathing I scarcely endeavored to conceal. I was rallied from several quarters for my abstraction and ungallant neglect of the ladies, but I cared little for that. All I cared about beside that one grand subject of my thoughts was to see the cups travel up to the tea tray and not come down again. I thought Mr. Millward never would cease telling us that he was no tea drinker and that it was highly injurious to keep loading the stomach with slops to the exclusion of more wholesome sustenance and so give himself time to finish his fourth cup. At length, it was over, and I rose and left the table with the guests without a word of apology. I could endure their company no longer. I rushed out to cool my brain in the balmy evening air, and to compose my mind or indulge my passionate thoughts in the solitude of the garden. To avoid being seen from the windows, I went down a quiet little avenue that skirted one side of the enclosure, at the bottom of which was a seat embowed in roses and honeysuckles. Here I sat down to think over the virtues and wrongs of the Lady of Wildfell Hall, but I had not been so occupied two minutes before voices and laughter and glimpses of moving objects through the trees informed me that the whole company had turned out to take an airing in the garden too. However, I nestled up in a corner of the bower and I hoped to retain possession of it, secure alike from observation and intrusion. But no, confound it there was someone coming down the avenue. Why couldn't they enjoy the flowers and sunshine of the open garden and leave that sunless nook to me and the gnats and the midges? But peeping through my fragrant screen of interwoven branches to discover who the intruders were, for a murmur of voices told me it was more than one, my vexation instantly subsided and far other feelings agitated my still unquiet soul for there was Mrs. Graham slowly moving down the walk with Arthur by her side and no one else. Why were they alone? Had the poison of detracting tongues already spread through all, and had they turned their backs upon her? I now recollected having seen Mrs. Wilson in the early part of the evening, edging her chair close up to my mother and bending forward, evidently in the delivery of some important 
confidential intelligence, and from the incessant wagging of her head, the frequent distortions of her wrinkled physiognomy, and the winking and malicious twinkle of her little ugly eyes, I judged it was some spicy piece of scandal that engaged her powers. And from the cautious privacy of their communication, I supposed some person then present was the luckless object of her calumnies. And from all those tokens together with my mother's looks and gestures of mingled horror and incredulity, I now concluded that the object to have been Mrs. Graham. I did not emerge from my place of concealment till she had nearly reached the bottom of the walk, lest my appearance should drive her away. And when I did step forward, she stood still and seemed inclined to turn back as it was. Oh, don't let us disturb you, Mr. Markham, said she. We came here to seek retirement ourselves, not to intrude on your seclusion. I am no hermit, Mrs. Graham, though I own it looks rather like it to absent myself in this uncourteous fashion from my guests. I feared you were unwell, said she with a look of real concern. I was rather, but it's over now. Do sit here a little and rest and tell me how you like this arbor, said I. And lifting Arthur by the shoulders, I planted him in the middle of the seat by way of securing his mamma, who, acknowledging it to be a tempting place of refuge, threw herself back in one corner while I took possession of the other. But that word refuge disturbed me. Had their unkindness then really driven her to seek for peace in solitude? Why have they left you alone? I asked. It is I who have left them, was the smiling rejoinder. I was wearied to death with small talk. Nothing wears me out like that. I cannot imagine how they can go on as they do. I could not help smiling at the serious depth of her wonderment. Is it that they think it a duty to be continually talking? Pursued she. And so never pause to think, but fill up with aimless trifles and vain repetitions when subjects of real interest fail to present themselves, or do they really take pleasure in such discourse? Very likely they do, said I. Their shallow minds can hold no great ideas, and their light heads are carried away by trivialities. That would not move a better furnished skull. And their only alternative to such discourse is to plunge over head and ears through a slew of scandal, which is their chief delight. Not all of them, surely, cried the lady, astonished at the bitterness of my remark. No, certainly, I exonerate my sister from such degraded tastes, and my mother too, if you included her in your animadversions. I meant no animadversions against anyone and certainly intended no dis disrespectful allusions to your mother. I have known some sensible persons, great adepts in that style of conversation, when circumstances impelled them to it, but it is a gift I cannot boast the possession of. I kept up my attention on this occasion as long as I could, but when my powers were exhausted, I stole away to seek a few minutes repose in this quiet walk. I hate talking, where there is no exchange of ideas or sentiments and no good given or received. Well, said I, if ever I trouble you with my loquacity, tell me so at once, and I promise not to be offended, for I possess the faculty of enjoying the company of those I, of my friends, as well in silence as in conversation. I don't quite believe you, but if it were so, you would exactly suit me for a companion. I am all you wish, then, in other respects? No, I don't mean that. How beautiful those little clusters of foliage look where the sun comes through behind them, said she, on purpose to change the subject. And they did look beautiful, where at intervals the level rays of the sun penetrating the thickness of trees and shrubs on the opposite side of the path before us relieved their dusky verdure by displaying patches of semi-transparent leaves of resplendent golden green. I almost wish I were not a painter, observed my companion. Why so? One would think at such a time you would most exult in your privilege of being able to imitate the various brilliant and delightful touches of nature. No, for instead of delivering up myself to the full enjoyment of them as others do, I am always troubling my head about how I could produce the same effect upon canvas and, as that can never be done, it is mere vanity and vexation of spirit. 
perhaps you cannot do it to satisfy yourself, but you may and do succeed in delighting others with the result of your endeavors. Well, after all, I should not complain. Perhaps a few people gain their livelihood with so much pleasure in their toil as I do. Here is someone coming. She seemed vexed at the interruption. It is only Mr. Lawrence and Miss Wilson, said I, coming to enjoy a quiet stroll. They will not disturb us. I could not quite decipher the expression in her face, but I was satisfied that there was no jealousy therein. What business had I to look for it? What sort of person is Miss Wilson? She asked. She is elegant and accomplished above the generality of her birth and station, and some say she is ladylike and agreeable. I thought her somewhat frigid and rather supercilious in her manner today. Very likely she might be so to you. She has possibly taken a prejudice against you, for I think she regards you in the light of a rival. Me? Impossible, Mr. Markham, said she, evidently astonished and annoyed. Well, I know nothing about it, returned I, rather doggedly, for I thought her annoyance was chiefly against myself. The pair had now approached within a few paces of us. Our arbor was set snugly back in a corner before which the avenue at its termination turned off into a more airy walk along the bottom of the garden. As they approached this, I saw by the aspect of Jane Wilson that she was directing her companion's attention to us, and as well by her cold, sarcastic smile as by the few isolated words of her discourse that reached me, I knew full well that she was impressing him with the idea that we were strongly attached to each other. I noticed that he colored up to the temples and gave us one furtive glance in passing and walked on looking grave, but seemingly offering no reply to her remarks. It was true then that he had some designs upon Mrs. Graham and were they honorable, he would not be so anxious to conceal them. She was blameless, of course, but he was detestable beyond all count. While these thoughts flashed through my mind, my companion abruptly rose and, calling her son, said they would now go in quest of the company and departed up the avenue. Doubtless she had heard or guessed something of Miss Wilson's remarks, and therefore it was natural enough that she should choose to continue the tete-a-tete -tete no longer, especially as at that moment my cheeks were burning with indignation against my former friend, the token of which she might mistake for a blush of stupid embarrassment. For this I owed Miss Wilson yet another grudge. And still the more I thought upon her conduct, the more I hated her. It was late in the evening before I joined the company. I found Mrs. Graham already equipped for departure and taking leave of the rest who were now returned to the house. I offered, nay, begged, to accompany her home. Mr. Lawrence was standing by at the time converse, conversing with somebody else. He did not look at us, but on hearing my earnest request, he paused in the middle of a sentence to listen for her reply and went on with a look of quiet satisfaction the moment he found it was to be a denial. A denial it was, decided, though not unkind. She could not be persuaded to think that there was danger for herself or her child in traversing those lonely lanes and fields without attendance. It was daylight still, and she should meet no one or if she did, the people were quiet and harmless, she was well assured. In fact, she would not hear of anyone's putting himself out of the way to accompany her, though Fergus vouchsafed to offer his services in case they should be more acceptable than mine, and my mother begged she might send one of the farming men to escort her. When she was gone, the rest was all a blank or worse, Lawrence attempted to draw me into conversation, but I snubbed him, and I went to another part of the room. Shortly after, the party broke up, and he himself took leave. When he came to me, I was blind to his extended hand and deaf to his good night until he repeated it a second time, and then to get rid of him, I muttered an inarticulate reply, accompanied by a sulky nod. What is the matter, Markham? whispered he. I replied by a wrathful and contemptuous stare. Are you angry because Mrs. Graham would not let you go home with her? He asked with a faint smile that nearly exasperated me beyond control. But swallowing down all fear, sir, answered, I merely demanded, what business is it of yours? 
Why, none, replied he with provoking quietness. Only, and here he raised his eyes to my face and spoke with unusual solemnity, only let me tell you, Markham, that if you have any designs in that quarter, they will certainly fail, and it grieves me to see you cherishing false hopes and wasting your strength in useless efforts for hypocrite, I exclaimed. And he held his breath and looked very blank and turned white about the gills and went away without another word. I had wounded him to the quick, and I was glad of it. End of chapter 9.